we're going to have a look today at an inspector course and we'll just start with the story. So with every text that you study for literature, you want to make sure that you know the story really well. And then when you're confident with the story, you can move on to the ideas, the language features and the kind of deeper meanings of the text. So always start with the story, even if you've not read the full text yet, it's good to give yourself a summary because it's not really about kind of unfolding the story in front of you when you do literature. It's more about understanding how everything fits together and what the point of it is and the meaning. So it's not cheating to actually give yourself an idea of the story before you've even read the actual text or in this case seen the play. So an inspector calls is a three act structure that's quite normal for plays. Uh, most plays are kind of three acts or five acts. And it's all set in the same location. So it's set in the Burlings household. And they're having an engagement party for Sheila and Gerald. So I'll have a look at act one first. So the setting is spring 1912. It was written in 1945 and when we do context we'll look into that in more detail but it is really important that you know that it's not set at the same time it was written so the people watching it are kind of a generation later than the people in it if that makes sense the family are celebrating sheila and gerald's engagement as i already said Mr. Burling, you can also call Arthur. So in your essays, you can call him Arthur, Arthur Burling, Mr. Burling. He gives a big speech about business and explains to Eric that every man should look, look after himself. So Eric Burling is his son. So we see Mr. Burling's attitudes to life from the beginning. And later on, you'll notice how those contrast a lot with the inspector. So an inspector calls on the family, he's called Inspector Ghoul. That word ghoul might or might not be symbolic, probably was intended as symbolic. He says a woman has committed suicide and he's investigating the circumstances of her death. So they're having a nice party, they're celebrating a happy moment in their life and this inspector comes in and totally disrupts the situation, completely changes feeling and the mood and the tone of the of the night so he makes it very serious and he starts questioning mr burling who's the head of the household and naturally it makes sense to question him first so he does have a relationship to the woman who committed suicide um, who's called eva smith and she actually used to work for him and he fired her because she was protesting about wages so he has a big speech about how she deserved it and how he didn't pay her any different from anyone else and that's minimum wage. And he refuses to accept any responsibility for her death. So he admits to knowing her, admits to firing her, refuses to accept any responsibility. So then at the end of Act 1, we shift to Sheila, who's the daughter of the Burling family. And we realise that Eva was sacked from her next job at a department store because Sheila was jealous. She was kind of jealous of her looks and she was just having a bad day and she felt a bit paranoid and Eva is sort of described as prettier than Sheila. So something to do with kind of emotional jealousy, I suppose. So Sheila's kind of horrified that she did this, but she does admit to getting Eva sacked. And then the end of Act 1, the inspector tells the family that Eva changed her name to Daisy Renton and Gerald seems very shocked. So it's pretty straightforward, the plot of an inspector calls. It's quite easy to kind of get stuck in your head. But the main thing that you need to understand, because when you're doing your structure and form points in your essays, you have to talk about the shape of the story. So the main thing you need to understand is the sequence of events. So what happens in what order? So billing. Mr. Billing first, then Sheila, and the whole time, hopefully you can see how this plot is building tension. So it's getting more and more confusing and dramatic. Because when the inspector questions Mr. Billing, we might just assume that that's it. You know, it's just Mr. Billing that had something to do with this woman. 
but then turning to Sheila, it seems like more of them knew her and they knew her in different situations, different contexts. And then Gerald as well at the end seems shocked. So Gerald also somehow seems to know her. <laughs> Sorry if you can hear snoring in the background, that's my dog. So act one is building tension, it's rising um, and becoming more dramatic. Look at act two then. Slightly different font for some reason. Daisy was forced to become a working girl. So we're kind of going through the shape of Daisy's life as we go through these characters' relationships to her. So after she couldn't work in the factory, she couldn't work in the department store, she had to turn to prostitution in order to support herself. So her life takes a tragic twist at this moment. Gerald admits that he knew Daisy and um, he actually met her in a bar, but let her stay in his friend's apartment because his friend was away for six months. And during that time, they had an affair. So this is while him and Sheila were also together. He finished the affair after a summer and he offered her money, but she didn't. I think she takes it. I can't quite remember, actually. I think she takes it, but they can't carry on. And it seems like from what he says, Daisy was in love with him, but it, for him, it wasn't ever serious and he knew it couldn't continue. So it's very important from her point of view because she became quite dependent on Gerald and it's not at all important from his point of view because she was just kind of a fling and uh, it didn't, you know, it was quite easy for him to leave her. So Sheila's very shocked um, because she's just got engaged to Gerald. She obviously didn't know about this. Um, there's some quite interesting dialogue at this point in the play if you read it where Mr Burling sort of tries to defend Gerald and it kind of suggested that Mr Burling was kind of bad and might have had affairs as well but it shows you the different attitudes at the time so um, from our modern point of view it's shocking from Sheila's emotional point of view it's shocking but these kind of businessmen at this time according to Priestley who wrote the play um, you know they were having affairs and it wasn't anything serious. What I find quite contradictory about an Inspector Calls is also that Priestley himself had affairs. So he was also not the nicest guy um, in that kind of way. But it does kind of, um, it kind of creates like a love triangle, it kind of entangles Sheila further with Daisy because obviously she was jealous about her beauty and then now her fiance has had an affair with this girl. So it makes it all even more dramatic and it spirals the story up into an even more intense kind of knot. So after Gerald's confession, he goes for a walk to clear his head and then the inspector turns to Mrs. Burling. So it sort of turns out everyone knows her in some way. Uh, everyone knows Eva or Daisy by this point. So Mrs. Burling initially looks at the picture and she's very sure she doesn't know her, but then the inspector sort of tells her how she knows her. So Mrs. Burling is part of a woman's charity called something to do with Women's Brumley Charity Organisation, something like that. Um, yeah, so she's, she's the chair at this time of the charity meeting. She's in charge and she makes the main decisions for the charity. And it's supposed to help women in need and Daisy goes for help and Mrs. Burling refuses. And she's also shocked that she calls, Eva calls herself Mrs. Burling. So she finds it insulting and dishonest and then refuses help. There's a little bit more here on the next page. So it turns out that Eva, Daisy, Mrs. Burling, this character, this girl was pregnant and not supported by the father. And Mrs. Burling says, it's not her problem, it's the father's problem. So he, she should have married the father, the father should take responsibility. It's kind of a dramatic moment where Sheila, Sheila realizes this before Mrs. Burling, but it turns out that the father is Eric, so the last character in the Burling family. So we'd maybe talk about this as being the climax moment of the play, the climax, 
um, everything's sort of been building and getting worse and worse and worse in, in Eva's life. Um, and at this point, being pregnant, having no money to support herself, being forced into prostitution, being rejected by um, employers, first of all, and then by lovers or suitors after that. And then finding herself alone, um, needing to support a baby and then being rejected by the women's charity. All of that, obviously, it sort of spirals downwards and it makes her life worse and worse. And then Eric being the father is dramatic because it actually really, it sort of means that this family had a personal connection to the woman as well as, um, you know, employing her or so on. So she was actually supposed to be part of their family. And uh, Mrs. Burling turned away her own unborn grandchild, which they make a big deal of in the play. So yeah, this is the most dramatic moment. So that's the first two acts. You can hopefully see how the tension's rising and everything's getting more and more entangled and um, Eva's life is getting worse and worse. Meanwhile, the Burlings seem more and more responsible somehow for this girl that they're denying any anything to do with. Um, you also notice that Mr. Burling and Mrs. Burling are quite stubborn and refuse any responsibility. But Sheila, who's a younger generation, is actually quite, she feels really bad for what, what she did to that girl. Gerald's sort of in the middle. I think he does feel bad, but he doesn't really reveal his emotions as strongly. So then we go to the final act, act three. Um, the actual story, as far as I'm concerned, the proper story, sort of finishes halfway through Act 3 with this final speech of the inspector. But then there's a kind of nice little twist at the ending as well to make it even more dramatic. So Eric tells the story of his involvement with Daisy, saying he met her in the same bar as Gerald. Um, we know that Eric's an alcoholic throughout the play and he was drunk at the time, forced his way into her room, got her pregnant. Um, he did like her, but she sort of treated him like a child. Um, when he realised she was pregnant, he didn't have a job, so he stole money from his father's business, from Mr Burling, to give to her. And when she realised it was stolen, she got shocked and refused to accept any more help, which is why she ended up at the women's charity. So Eric, Eric seems like a pretty despicable character at this point. Mr. and Mrs. Burling are really disgusted with Eric, but you have to kind of question their parenting and, and how they could raise someone who thought this was okay. Everybody finally understands that they all had some part to play in her suicide, but again, Mr. and Mrs. Burling refused to, to budge. Eric and Sheila, however, show a lot of remorse. They feel really guilty. So the inspector delivers a really important speech. It's, it's worth memorizing a couple of quotes from that speech. Um, the main gist of it is that we all should look after each other and realize how our lives all connect in some way. And it's not just about being nice to your family. You should be nice to everyone and extend the same courtesy that you would to your family, to your friends and to anybody in society. So the inspector delivers this very powerful speech and then he leaves and the family start questioning what actually happened. They sort of be a, become a bit suspicious of him. Gerald calls to check on facts. So he, he calls the infirmary, the hospital, to see if anybody committed suicide there that day. Because this is obviously the inspector calling about the suicide. And he's told that there weren't any suicides. So the older generation are kind of relieved and they think it was a big scam. And then the younger generation are still not sure. They're kind of questioning their actions. So this is an important end to the story because we realise that the older generations are stubborn and resistant to change. The younger ones are the ones that might change and they provide hope for the future, according to Priestley. So the dramatic twist at the end is that the telephone rings, Mr. Burling answers, and they're just told that a, a police inspector is on his way to ask questions about the suicide of a young girl. So 
it kind of leaves you thinking was Inspector Ghoul a ghost? What's going on? How does it end? And so on. So there's this kind of circular structure to the story. But the main thing is um, the way that the characters are sort of, their flaws are revealed throughout the story and the inspector has a way of kind of, I don't know, bringing out the problems with their character and the way that they act in life. So it's just a quick lesson really, but hopefully, I know I've talked loads, but you hopefully understand the shape of the story now, you know how it all fits together. And when you read the story or when you watch the play, you won't get lost and you'll be able to focus a bit more on the ideas rather than being confused about what's happening. There's a lot of tiny little twists and turns in this story, so it is worth being really familiar before you start going deeper into anything like the techniques or the quotes and so on. So yeah, thanks for listening and hopefully you enjoyed the lesson. I'll see you guys soon.